Good day and welcome to the Myomo third quarter 2024 financial results conference call. All participants will be in listen only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on a touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Tim, I'm sorry, to Kim Goladetz. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Kim Goladetz with Alliance Advisors IR. Welcome to the Myoma third quarter 2024 conference call. Earlier this afternoon, Myomo issued a news release announcing financial results for the three and nine months ended September 30th, 2024. If you would like to be added to the company's email distribution list to receive future announcements, please register on the company's website at myomo.com or call Alliance Advisors IR at 310-691-7100 and speak with Danny Chertok. With me on today's call from Myoma are Paul Godonis, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Dave Henry, Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I'd like to caution listeners that statements made during this conference call by management, other than historical facts, are forward-looking statements. The words anticipate, believe, estimate, expect, intend, guidance, outlook, confidence, target, project, and other similar expressions are typically used to identify such forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and may involve and are subject to certain risks and uncertainties and other factors that may affect Myoma's business, financial condition, and operating results. These and additional risks, uncertainties, and other factors are discussed in Myoma's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission including on Forms 10-K and 10-Q. Actual outcomes and results may differ materially from what's expressed in or implied by these forward-looking statements. Except as required by law, Myelmo undertakes no obligation to revise or update any forward-looking statements to reflect events or circumstances after the date of this call. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Myelmo CEO, Paul Godonis. Paul, please go ahead. Thanks, Kim. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We achieved another quarter of strong growth in the third quarter of 2024, building on our momentum since the Medicare fees for the MyoPro powered arm braces went into effect beginning April 1st. We're now able to serve the many patients in the U.S. who are covered by standard Medicare Part B, and we achieved quarterly records in important business metrics, including revenue, revenue units, pipeline ads, order rent pipeline size, insurance authorizations and orders, and MyoPro shipments. But with the reclassification of the MyoPro into the brace category and the publication of the medical allowable, Medicare allowable earlier this year, we established three major objectives for the company. Start providing the MyoPro to eligible standard Medicare Part B beneficiaries whom we had to turn away before engage the many orthotics and prosthetics clinics across the country who would now be interested in becoming a distribution channel for us, and three, begin the process of establishing contracts with payers for in-network status of our direct provider business. I'll provide a status report on these initiatives by reviewing the key data points across our revenue cycle, from patient candidates who are interested in MyoPro through to revenue units in the quarter. We added 645 medically qualified candidates to the patient pipeline, which was up 69% from the year ago quarter as our addressable market has increased to include Medicare Part B patients that did not have access to the MyoPro in the past. Our marketing efficiency also improved with the cost per pipeline ad down 25% from last year to $1,618 per qualified ad. We received insurance authorizations and orders for a record 225 MyoPros in the third quarter, including medically qualified Medicare patients, which was up sequentially and also up 44% year over year. Revenue units based on devices delivered to patients or payments received totaled 161 MyoPros, 
up 35% from a year ago, and the ASP, or the average selling price, increased to an adjusted $52,700 per unit, as Dave, our CFO, will explain. As a result of more mile pro volume and a higher ASP, our product revenue is a record $9.2 million, up 83% over the same period in 2023. These revenue units included 87 MyoPros delivered to Medicare Part D beneficiaries, and this is in addition to the shipments to Medicare Advantage, VA, orthotics and prosthetics clinics, and international customers. With the large number of additions to the patient pipeline, we exited the quarter with 1,263 candidates in the process of obtaining a physician's order and the necessary medical documentation for a MyoPro. And with the large number of new orders, our backlog stood at a record 316 units, which represents over $16 million of potential revenue. As we're developing the OP channel in September, we attended the American Orthotics and Prosthetics National Association Assembly, which is the largest conference for orthotics and prosthetics, or O&P clinics, in the U.S. With clarity on Medicare Part B reimbursement, we're now able to recruit these O&P clinics provide the MyoPro to stroke survivors, knowing that this is a patient population they already serve with ankle foot orthoses and other braces. Our team of business development managers and clinical trainers serving this OMP channel is up and running, and we have a standing room only crowd of more than 100 clinical professionals attending our manufacturer's workshop at the conference. To train these clinicians on the MyoPro, we launched the MyoMo Academy, which is an online learning platform specifically for OMP professionals. We're also conducting a number of in-person training sessions as part of the certification program for OMP clinics to become a MyoPro Center of Excellence. These training sessions have included many independent OMP clinic owners and CPOs, which are certified prosthetist orthodists, as well as Hanger Clinics, which is the largest nationwide operator of OMP clinical facilities. We set a goal of recruiting and training 100 clinicians by the end of this year and I'm pleased to report that we've already surpassed that goal. These process and orthodists are now starting to evaluate patients, and after they receive the med necessary medical documentation, they'll begin to place orders for custom IOPRO for their patients. We've already seen an uptick in activity from the ONP channel, and we expect that ONP orders will increase in 2025 as their patient pipelines are growing. However, it can take several months for patients to see their primary care, other qualified physician, and to obtain all the necessary uh, clinical notes, which are required before a MyoPro order can be placed. While our direct provider business with Medicare, our international operations, and our progress with the o and channel has been going well, I'm frustrated with some of the Medicare Advantage plans. Rather than following Medicare's lead in covering the MyoPro for their members, we've seen mixed results from these payers so far. It's been widely reported that some Medicare Advantage payers are making it more difficult for patients and providers to get the care they deserve, which is what we are seeing as well. As a result, more authorization requests are being denied initially, forcing us to file more appeals for pre-authorizations with some plans. On the other hand, some Medicare Advantage plans that did not cover the MyoPro in the past have started to do so, which is a good thing for their members. Additionally, the good news is that we've seen some of the Medicare Advantage plans pay a more appropriate amount now that the Medicare allowable rate has been published. As for the third objective, uh, contracts with payers, since this year's developments with Medicare, our chief medical officer has been working with private payers to begin the contracting process for Myomo to become an in-network provider. While this can be a multi-year process due to the meetings required with medical directors and then the contracting staff, we recently announced we've entered into our first two contracts one with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, another with Paradigm, which is a leading workers' compensation organization. Together, these two payers represent 3 million covered lives at the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, plus employees served by Paradigm for workplace injuries. We have other ongoing dialogues with other payers, which we believe will lead to additional contracts down the road. With the growth in the pipeline, orders and channels, even adding capacity to meet demand, We've gone from about 100 employees at the beginning of the year to 180 now, and we'll be moving to a larger production facility in the Boston area later this year to accommodate the expected growth in shipments this quarter and in the future. As I mentioned, our international operations based in Germany continue to perform well with a record $1 million of revenue in the quarter. 
Also, our China joint venture, Jiangxi Myomo, is making progress in obtaining the necessary regulatory approvals from the NMPA, the equivalent of a Chinese FDA, to begin sales and production of Myomo units, in addition to undertaking a clinical trial with some key hospital partners as part of their market access plan. We don't expect much in the way of revenue from China at this point, but we're getting well positioned to capitalize on this very large opportunity. And with that overview, I'll turn the call over to our CFO, Dave Henry, for a deeper dive into the quarterly financials, and I'll return with some additional comments on our business plans. Dave? Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me start my remarks with a review of our third quarter financial results. Revenue for the third quarter of 2024 was a record $9.2 million. <clears throat> This consisted entirely of product revenue and was up 81% over the prior year quarter's total revenue which included a payment under our licensing arrangement with the joint venture company in China. Product revenue was up 83% over last year's third quarter. Product revenue growth was driven by a record 161 MyoPro revenue units, up 35% year over year. Our average selling price, or ASP, was also a record at approximately $57,200. ASP was favorably impacted by supplemental insurance payments in the third quarter on revenue units recognized in a prior period. This is the result of the transition to recognizing revenue on delivery to Medicare patients effective July 1, 2024. Excluding these payments, ASP was $52,700 in the third quarter, still a record high. For Medicare Part B and certain commercial payers were recognizing revenue at delivery in an amount expected to be paid by both the primary and supplemental insurance payer, with the exception of Medicaid. Note that Medicare Advantage payers are, in most cases, now reimbursing us based on the fees published by CMS. As a result, 94% of third quarter product revenue was recognized at either shipment or delivery, compared with 76% in the year ago period. 55% of product revenue in the third quarter came from Medicare Part B patients, up from 47% in the second quarter, reflecting our success in reaching out to and educating these patients on the benefits of the MyoPro. Revenue from patients with Medicare Advantage plans represented 24% of third quarter revenue, and Medicare Advantage revenue was down 26% year over year. A challenging reimbursement environment with Medicare Advantage plans continued in the third quarter, which is resulting in fewer first-time authorizations and more denials, leading to more administrative law judge hearings in order to obtain an authorization for the patient. Our success rate with ALJ hearings remains constant at around 40 to 50 percent of cases. However, as Paul mentioned, we're seeing some good news in that certain Medicare Advantage payers that were previously not reimbursing for the MyoPro have begun providing pre-authorizations. Of the 161 revenue units in the third quarter, approximately 24% resulted from fill, which is our term for our authorizations on orders received and converted to revenue in the same quarter. Driven by revenue from Medicare Part B patients, 81% of our revenue in the third quarter came from the direct billing channel compared with 69% in the prior year quarter. International revenue was a record 1.1 million in the third quarter, representing 12% of third quarter revenue, which primarily came from Germany. In the third quarter of 2024, both pipeline additions and total pipeline reached new records. The pipeline was 1,263 patients at the end of the third quarter, an increase of 21% year over year. There were a record 645 additions to the pipeline in the third quarter, an increase of 69% year over year. Of the pipeline additions in the third quarter, 30% were Medicare Part B patients, about 15% of the total pipeline at the end of the third quarter were Medicare Part B patients. This reflects the increased velocity in moving Medicare patients through the process of obtaining a MyoPro as compared with payers that require pre-authorization. Reported backlog represents insurance authorizations and orders received but not yet converted to, re to revenue and in the case of Medicare Part B patients, those patients from whom we've collected medical records and deemed qualified for delivery based on our inclusion criteria. Our backlog at the end of the third quarter was a record 316 patients, up 71% from our backlog at the end of third quarter 2023. 
Pending third quarter backlog includes 114 Medicare Part B patients that have either been qualified for the delivery with appropriate medical documentation or have received their MyoPro and claims have not been filed, but that's very small now in, in the overall percentage. A payment is not, excuse me, but the Medicare portion of the backlog increased 19% sequentially. Contributing to our backlog was a record 225 authorizations and orders, an increase of 44% year over year. Gross margin for the third quarter of 2024, coming entirely from product sales, was 75.4% compared with 68.7% for the prior year quarter. The increase was driven primarily by the higher ASP I mentioned and by higher fixed cost absorption. Excluding the license revenue, gross margin on product sales was 68.4% in the third quarter of 2023. Operating expenses for the third quarter of 2024 were 7.9 million, an increase of 43% compared with the third quarter of 2023. This increase was driven primarily by the higher headcount throughout the organization to increase capacity and to accelerate completion of certain engineering projects and new product development. In addition, advertising expense of $1 million was up 23% year over year as we successfully undertook efforts to increase the number of patients at the top of the funnel. Cost per pipeline ad was $1,618, which was down 25% compared with the prior year quarter. Operating loss for the third quarter of 2024 was 1 million, which is half the $2 million operating loss for the same period a year ago. Net loss for the third quarter of 2024 was 1 million or 3 cents per share. This per compares with a net loss of 2 million or 6 cents per share for the third quarter of 2023. Approximately 7.7 .7 million pre-funded warrants are still outstanding from our offerings in 2023 and in January 2024. These pre-funded warrants are considered common stock equivalents under GAAP and are included in our weighted average shares outstanding. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter of 2024 was a negative 600,000 compared with a negative 1.7 million for the third quarter of 2023. Looking at our year-to-date financial results, revenue for the nine months ended September 30th, 2024 was 20.5 million up 41% compared with the same period a year ago, and product revenue increased 61%. Year-to-date gross margin was 71.1% compared with 69.6% .6 in the year-ago period, or 65.4% excluding license revenue. Operating expenses for the first nine months of 2024 were $20.5 million, an increase of 29% compared with the same period a year ago. Operating loss for the first nine months of 2024 was 6 million, compared with an operating loss of 5.8 million for the same period a year ago. Net loss for the first nine months of 2024 was 5.9 million, or 16 cents per share, compared with a net loss of 5.7 million, or 21 cents per share for the same period a year ago. Adjusted EBITDA was a negative 5.3 million for the first nine months of 2024 compared with a negative 4.9 million for the year ago period. Turning now to our balance sheet and cash flows, cash, cash equivalents and restricted cash as of September 30th, 2024 were 7 million. Cash used in operating activities was 1.5 million for the third quarter of 2024, compared with 1.7 million for the third quarter of 2023. Operating cash flow in the third quarter was impacted by a payment delay from CMS in the last few weeks of the quarter due to a transition from check payments to electronic payments. Payment hold was mandated by, mandated by CMS while our bank accounts were being verified. That delay pushed roughly 600,000 of payments into the fourth quarter. As of today, we're being paid electronically by all of the billing regions, and they have caught up and paid the outstanding claims from September. Restricted cash of $375,000 consists of funds held by our bank to collateralize a letter of credit, which represents the security deposit for our new headquarters building. We expect to occupy the building by the end of the year. We have an accounts receivable line of credit with Silicon Valley Bank that provides for borrowing of up to $4 million based on 80% of eligible accounts receivable as defined in the agreement. As of today, we have not drawn on the credit line. We believe our cash and cash equivalents are sufficient to fund our operations for at least the next 12 months. 
Turning to our financial guidance, given our backlog, we believe we are positioned for a third consecutive quarter of record revenue. We expect revenue for the fourth quarter to be in the range of 9.5 million to 10.5 million. This represents between 100% and 121% year-over-year growth. As a result, we're raising our full-year revenue guidance to 30 million to 31 million, up from our previous guidance range of 28 million to 30 million. We are also reiterating our expectation that based on this revenue guidance, operating cash flow break-even is still achievable in the fourth quarter. We also expect to approach adjusted EBITDA break-even in fourth quarter. However, in order to achieve these targets, we assume no supply chain disruptions, no delays in the receipts of expected payments, including a contractual reimbursement from the landlord of our new facility, and no increase in day sales outstanding. With that financial overview, I'll turn the call back to Paul. Thanks, Dave. Well, we're looking forward to a strong finish to this transformational year as the clarity of reimbursement with Medicare coverage and payments has been a significant inflection point for MyOMO. In addition to the continued growth in quarterly revenues in Q4, we're continuing to build out the O&P distribution channel. In fact, this week we're attending a major regional O&P conference in New Jersey that's being attended by several hundred clinicians, and we're scheduling more training classes. We also received a very positive comment from a Hanger Clinics executive after participating in one of our recent sessions, telling us that our manufacturer's training was among the best their clinicians have ever experienced, and I'm really proud of our team. So with that update and overview of our plans for the rest of 2024, we're now ready to take your questions. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Well, before we turn to your questions, I want to mention that we've participated in several conferences in the past 60 days, including the H.C. Wainwright, Lake Street, and Maxim conferences, and we will be attending the 15th annual Craig Hallam Alpha Select Conference in New York City on November 19th. We're also available for virtual and in-person investor meetings, so to arrange a meeting, contact the conference organizer or call Alliance Advisors IR, who can assist you to schedule one. Okay, operator, we're ready for the first question if you are. Okay. The first question comes from Chase Knickerbocker of Craig Hallam. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking the questions, and um, congrats on the on the great progress here. Uh, just first, just around ASP, what percentage of Part B patients um, is supplemental insurance you know, or Medicaid kicking in to kind of pay that last 20%? And then I think kind of just backing up, uh, how are you thinking about ASPs? You know, obviously almost 53,000, very strong, right around that max allow, 80% of your max allowable. Um, do you think we still have, you know, room to go higher on kind of bra um, portfolio ASPs, or should we think about this being, you know, pretty close to the ceiling? Thanks. Yeah, the, um, uh, you know, the, the 527 was based on, as I mentioned, the fact that the, the supplemental payments were received um, in third quarter off revenue units in the second quarter. Now, when we recognize revenue here going forward, we're recognizing revenue and the amount that's expected to be paid. So there are some supplemental insurance plans that we, you know, we believe and we've made the assessment that they're going to pay us. So if it's a motion G, we will go ahead and recognize $64,000 roughly of revenue at delivery. Now, in the case of Medicaid, uh, where you know we don't have uh, you know Medicaid coverage yet, or something we're working on, um, you know we will only recognize fifty-one thousand dollars where their secondary coverage is Medicaid. So, in all overall, I would say about twenty to twenty-five percent of our uh, patients so far have supplemental insurance coverage, where we'll take that incremental revenue at delivery. Um, as to whether the the 52,700 represents something, uh, you know, could there be ASP growth in the future? I think, uh, uh, 
I think that mix of, uh, of whether these patients have supplemental insurance or not will depend on that. And then once the O&P channel kicks in, I think then we might, we'll probably start to see a, you know, a, you know, a lowering of the ASP as that mix changes. But you know, that's more of a 2025 issue. Makes sense. And maybe just kind of going there on the O&P side. Um, you know, great to hear about the progress thus far and what you kind of have planned through the rest of the year. Um, how do you think as far as kind of how quick those O&P providers can start generating revenue? Do you have kind of an idea yet? And then any early thoughts on next year, Paul, as far as what that channel can contribute from a standpoint of kind of your overall volume? Thanks. Well, in our experience with these O&P clinicians, you know, they'll first go through the initial training to evaluate patients. You know, then maybe over the next uh, month or two, they'll have uh, the right patients coming into their clinic for an AFO, and they may be a MyoPro candidate. And then they'll evaluate if they're a suitable candidate. They will send that patient to their physician uh, to get the written order, to get all the medical documentation. You know, our experience with that is it's typically six to eight weeks for a patient to you know, get those appointments, come back to the documentation, and that O&P provider's got a range to do the measurement of that patient's arm to send us the order. So, you know, it's a three to four month process uh, after getting that initial training before we will see those initial orders. Uh, and then uh, my experience with this channel too is that uh, they'll want to first fit that first patient. So it might be another 30, 40 days later when they fit that patient. They want to see how the patient does. They'll want to make sure they got that payment, whether it's from Medicare or one of the other private payers. And so we'll probably see an initial order you know, from these uh, providers over the first uh, six months. And then we'll see another order, another order. So we'll start to pick up uh, after that. It's not going to be a, a step function, but we are bringing a lot of these OMP clinics into the fold. So I expect we'll start to see uh, an uptake in orders, especially uh, in the first quarter of 2025. Got it. And then just, you know, kind of following up on those on those comments, going to the manufacturing side, you just confirm that you're still at about kind of 80 units a month as far as production capacity, what you're kind of churning out in your current facility. And then kind of how quickly do you think you can get up and running in the new facility? And then I guess how quickly do you think you'll need that expanded um, kind of capacity from that new facility? And, and what do you think you can kind of get out of one shift at this new facility? Thanks. Uh -huh. Well, uh, the good news is our manufacturing team has worked really well to get more efficient. You know, we're even exceeding that 80 units per month right now here in our Boston uh, facility in downtown. Uh, and we've got a, a very good plan to start uh, a parallel facility uh, set up uh, in a new Burlington workspace. So we'll start manufacturing there in addition to what we've got here in Boston, and then we'll finally migrate all of it by the end of the year. So, you know, I expect that you know, over the next uh, six months, we ought to be able to double capacity you know, based on the, all the workstations we're putting in place. And then after that, we can either add more uh, first shift workstations or consider a second shift. So this new space you know, gives us plenty of flexibility to keep expanding capacity to meet the growing demand. Great. Thanks, Paul. Congratulations. Well, actually, and, and one other thing, too. Sorry. We'll, we'll also get, uh, you know, initially we're going to move in and we'll, uh, we'll occupy about 27,500 square feet for office and manufacturing. And then come uh, June, around, June, around June of 2025, we will get another 7,500 square feet of manufacturing space. So um, I think we'll have plenty to, to, to meet our needs here uh, as we go to 2025 and beyond. And we've got a total of 13,500 here in Boston, so you see we're basically tripling the space with uh, most of that expansion for manufacturing. Yeah. Operator, do we have another question? Yes, we do. Our next question is from Scott Henry of AGP. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, congratulations on continued strong momentum. Uh, uh, I'll start at the top of the funnel. Uh, new candidate adds uh, 645, obviously a, a very large number. Uh, do you think you can grow it much from there, or you're just trying to get a sense of what capacity is for the top of the funnel? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, and our plan is to continue growing it. 
uh, by uh, again, uh, advertising expenditures. We did uh, spend more in advertising uh, in Q3, as Dave mentioned. But we typically cut back on some of the advertising in Q4 just because we're competing until yesterday with the election advertising. All the Medicare Advantage plans are still advertising until mid-December, and you've got holiday spending there as well. So we can serve some of our uh, spending, but we will continue to grow that pipeline. Uh, we've also added in our own direct billing operation, you know, more certified process orthotists. Uh, we have a dedicated team to evaluate patients online for that initial screening. So, you know, Scott, yeah, we're planning to continue growing because, again, we're at a very early stage of market penetration given the huge number of people that need this myoprolorthosis. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and then, you know, thinking about 2025, if you take your 4Q number, annualizing it, you're already at $40 million. Uh, any thoughts as to what kind of growth we could see from 24 to 25? And also, for Dave, uh, should we factor in kind of, you know, Q1 tends to be seasonably a little weaker for a multitude of reasons. Just uh, trying to get your thoughts on, on that year. Yeah, I think, you know, part of what we were doing was spending the, the money we did on advertising was to try to mitigate, if you will, uh, some of that season, that first quarter seasonality by getting uh, patients into the pipeline so that we can, uh, you know, overcome what we typically see is, which is, as Paul mentioned in the fourth quarter, you know, that we don't spend as much on advertising. The pipeline ads are usually down in the fourth quarter, but we wanted to have sort of, a, you know, build up, build up a pipeline to try to compensate for some of that. So it's a little bit early to tell in terms of what, if we can we'll actually be able to do that, I think we'll have to know the, our, uh, you know, the metrics that we're able to generate, the ads and things like that, and the authorizations and orders. I think I'll need to wait to see on that before I, you know, give any color as to whether we think uh, you know, we can overcome some of that seasonality in the first quarter. And I think, you know, uh, in terms of the full year, um, I'll wait to give guidance until, you know, until March on that, but uh, I, I certainly sit, sit here and believe that you know if we, you know if we exit fourth quarter on you know ten million dollars, which is the midpoint of our guidance, I, I think that you know I, I think we'd be disappointed if we had less than forty million dollars of revenue in 2025. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that color. Uh, final question, uh, just on the OMP channel, uh, you know. I think Medicare, we thought of as kind of a, a degree of magnitude relative to your base business, almost kind of doubled it. How, how should we think about the peak impact for that OMP channel? You say the uh, peak impact, meaning uh, over time? I mean, it could be a very yeah, large percentage of our total business. Because you know, most orthotic and prosthetics products are actually delivered through the OMP channel. You know, if you look at other manufacturers of uh, whether it's uh, the sea leg or uh, you know upper extremity prosthesis and so on, so no, we're very optimistic about building this channel up over time. In the meantime, though, we're going to continue to invest in our own direct provider business because we've shown that we have really over the last five years built, built a really good commercial engine that is very getting more and more efficient all the time in terms of you know the cost per pipeline ad, the ability to move these patients through the process to deliver high quality patient care. So uh, it's a dual growth strategy, the O&P channel plus our direct provider business. Uh, I, I, uh, you remind me of uh, this question reminds me of a comment you made regarding um, Hanger, because I think you had a conversation and they mentioned how many AFOs, mm -hmm. ankle foot orthosis, they, they, they might deliver in a year. And there's a good number of those people who get AFOs from Hanger that may be candidates for a mile throw. And I think that could be a very sizable number, and you know, you know that could be in the thousands per year just from hanger. That's right. Okay, great. Uh, appreciate the color on that, and thank you for taking the questions. Thank you, Scott. The next question comes from Anthony Vendetti of Maxim Group. Go ahead, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, you have 316 units. Uh, in backlog as of September 30th, which is up 71%, which is great. Um, can you talk about 
you know the value of of that backlog um, and and then you know when it should be recognized uh, approximately over over what time period? Yeah. So um, the as you know, um, you know the 316. Um, some of those will patients will drop out of backlog. It always happens. Typically, you know that percentage is you know somewhere around you know 15 to 20 percent uh, will drop out. And so you know that that will leave you know, you know being conservative. I guess if you take 20 to 20 percent, that maybe uh, 250 remain, and, and if the value of that backlog is uh, or the ASP, just say fifty thousand dollars, so you're you know you have the you have a value sort of a net value I'll say of uh, over ten million dollars. And it usually gets realized over the next then, three yeah, to six months. Yeah, and then yeah, sorry, and then the um, typically um, the way you know our backlog uh, will be realized about thirty five to forty percent is uh, will turn into revenue one quarter out. And then, you know, a decreasing percentage from there. It, it depends on, you know, the number of Medicare Advantage payers that are in the backlog and how long it takes, to, you know, to uh, get reimbursed from them and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's helpful. And then, um, you know, as, as, as uh, you've been ramping up, um, you know, how many, how many direct sales people do you have now and and how many do you hope to have by the end of this year? Well, remember as a clinical services provider ourselves, uh, we really don't have direct sales people. Uh, we have clinicians, so these are licensed CPOs who will then evaluate interested patients. You know, we generate that patient demand primarily through the social media, some television advertising, clinical referrals from doctors and therapists. So they're not really salespeople, they're just uh, clinicians who are evaluating those patients, and then after we get the green light to go ahead and fit them, uh, they will do the fitting, and then we'll just uh, build those patients. On the OMP channel side, we've got two business development representatives, and so their job is to recruit these OMP providers, get them excited about becoming a certified uh, center of excellence. Okay, so you have two of those on the OMP side. And how many clinical specialists? Yeah, so we've got uh, 10 plus we just hired a couple more, so uh, call it a dozen right now in the, in the field across the country. Excellent. Um, and then obviously you, you have a, you know, a huge opportunity here in the U.S. Um, can you talk about, you know, your international plans, um, whether that's, you know, something you're looking at ramping uh, now or, you know, uh, sometime in 25, or is that more like a 26 uh, plan? Well, we continue to plan to ramp up, uh, especially our operations in Germany, because, you know, we're succeeding there. It's a good-sized market. Reimbursement is good with the statutory health uh, insurance companies. We've got a network of over 100 OMP providers already trained there. And so we're adding our own staff uh, there to you know, support these OMP providers. And we're basically doubling down there in Germany. We're looking at other Markets, you know, it's typically a two to three year process with a new market. Let's say a France, for example, uh, Italy. You'd have to you, know, you have to put some boots on the ground. You have to meet with the regulators. You have to meet with the insurance company, medical directors. So similar to what we had to do in Germany originally. With what we have to do here in the U.S. with payers and CMS. And so I think uh, we're going to defer that. So you know, we're in a bigger position, to, you know, revenue wise. They can afford to make that investment, which again it pays off, but it's about you know uh, two to three years uh, of investment to get there. Okay, so the focus, because you've been in Germany, will be to continue to continue to build that out, the U.S. and then uh, it sounds like maybe France and Italy would be next, but that's a two to three year process to get that built out and ready to go. Right. And in the meantime, we're uh, cheering on our. China Joint Venture Partners, uh, they're starting to get uh, the necessary NMPA uh, uh, approval, so hopefully they'll start generating revenue in 2025 and, and then associated uh, license fees back to us. Okay, and then last question uh, on the R&D front, any, um, any particular developments there, any uh, improvements or modifications to the, to the current uh, brace that's out there? 
Yes, we've been expanding our R&D staff, uh, and at, we've been uh, working on new enhancements in MyoPro 2 Plus. We've taken them out uh, in at-home trials uh, with patients, uh, and we got some good feedback to, hey, make these other changes. So I said, you know what, rather than introducing product enhancements right now, let's push that out a bit because I'd rather put in those additional features. It also broadens the number of people who might be qualified for MyoPro. Uh, and so you'll see uh, some announcements of that uh, probably uh, in, in Q1 of 2025. Excellent. Thanks for all that color. I appreciate it. I'll hop back in the queue. Thanks, Anthony. The next question comes from Ben Haynor of Lake Street Capital Markets. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, first off, congrats on getting the uh, 100 OMP clinicians trained up, and uh, you know, obviously the high praise that you received there—that's that's definitely encouraging. Hey, can you talk a little bit about maybe what the demand looks like uh, for more OMP clinicians to get trained? I mean, how quickly can you cha train, you know, the next hundred and the next hundred beyond that? Um, you know, just any thoughts there would be would be helpful. Sure. Well, one of the reasons we invested in creating the Myomo Academy as an online learning platform is so that clinicians who are interested, they sign a contract with us, they have access to that, and they can start to do this learning online. And we do uh, online classes for these individuals so that they can start that evaluation process. Uh, we'll team up uh, by sending our clinicians to go with them to evaluate patients, to do in-service presentations at various rehab hospitals. Uh, and we have a plan for, you know, a number of classes uh, in the new year. And so uh, as we see more and more demand, you know, our team, as I said, is in New Jersey at this regional conference this week. Uh, you know, if there's more and more demand, you know, we can keep growing the team that's associated with that OMP channel because I really want to uh, develop it. Makes make sense. And then what goes into them ultimately becoming a center of excellence, you know, the initial training uh, online, the, you know, then kind of what's the the procedure, what happens after that to, to get to that center of excellence uh, sort of level? Well, it's an important investment from them because it takes uh, three days for one of these CPOs to become qualified uh, to deliver a MyoPro. So they learn about the evaluation process, about the medical documentation that's required by Medicare or other payers. Uh, then they learn to do what we call shape capture to measure the arm and hand because, again, every patient is unique. And then after they place their order, uh, we'll make sure that we assist them in terms of the delivery of the product so they have that hands-on training with the patient as well. And then there's the follow-up care. So it's a three-day uh, program, which means they have to be out of clinic for three days. Uh, so, uh, you know, they understand that uh, that's the investment they have to make. But in return, you know, they can earn that Medicare allowable for every Medicare patient uh, that they see and put into a MyoPro. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And then lastly for me, uh, on uh, the Q4 guidance, th does that have any anything factored in from the OMP channel, or is that would that be kind of pure upside? Yeah, I, mean, I, it, I think the assumption is is sort of the, the typical rate that we see. The OMP channel was only was three percent of revenue in the uh, in the third quarter, so. Um, you know, we've we talked about the OMP channel being more of a 2025 thing, and so that's that's what our assumption is in the fourth quarter. Okay, got it. Well, thanks for taking the questions, gentlemen, and congrats on all the progress. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. The next question comes from Edward Wu of Ascendian Capital. Go ahead, please. Yeah, congratulations on the quarter. My question is, as you guys move into uh, the new facility, how much more operating leverage can you get in your business? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, we'll have, uh, we will have to pay a higher rental, of course, so we'll have to sort of absorb that before we, uh, and just more space, um, you know, and, and more, more, more uh, lease dollars, but so we'll have to absorb that before we get um, leverage, but that's you know that shouldn't be too too hard. And if we're and if we're doubling the capacity, um, I think that uh, you know, if we can get up to that uh, those kinds of numbers, that sure we'll be de we'll be generating uh, you know, a fairly good um, incremental um, operating income from from what we're doing. Particularly, I think as we 
we're looking to see that O and P channel grow because you know there will be more leverage I think from even though the ASP will be lower um, I think the, because we because we don't have to spend incremental advertising dollars and clinical dollars for an O and P patient um, you know we'll, we'll we'll be really looking to see that channel grow as well in combination with the volume with the volume growth to really drive you know that leverage that we're looking for. As as you expand your volume and capacity, is there opportunities for gross margin expansion? I think as as I mentioned with the O and P channel, as as that grows and becomes a bigger part of our revenue, I I think we see you know the gross margins, you know, where they're in the you know mid you know mid seventies now, low to mid seventies, they may go down below seventy percent as the O and P channel becomes more prevalent because you know the ASP will be lower, but then again, I think you know the, there shouldn't be as much incremental opex required to serve that channel. So I think it's it's possible that that channel is operating margin accreted as we go forward, and so that's you know, that's sort of the the operating model that we would like to see. So um, so again, I think with the channel, you could see gross margin dilution a bit with that channel, but potentially operating margin accretion. Great. Well, thanks for answering my questions, and I wish you guys good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. We are out of time, and therefore this concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Paul Godonis, Chairman and CEO, for any closing remarks. Well, thank you, Operator. Well, in closing, I'd like to remind you that we are in the business of patient care. There's no better proof to that than success stories. One of our recent MyoPro recipients is a 50-year-old female who suffered a stroke in 2020. She lost the ability to use her dominant right arm and hand, and she was evaluated for MyoPro back in August 2023. After receiving an insurance denial, our patient advocacy team successfully appealed this decision, and she was fit with the MyoPro this past August. And in just two months, she's become a rock star user who performs many activities of daily living, such as cooking, feeding herself, doing the laundry, and more, thanks to her MyoPro. Well, by continuing to assist more individuals like her, we're going to build a growing and profitable company. So thanks again for joining our call today, and have a nice evening. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.